Now in the last two videos, the rules that we considered for the quantifiers in formal deductive systems were pretty straightforward. And so were the examples that we gave of how they work. In this video, I want to look at a couple more difficult proofs so that we can think more generally about strategy and tactics for working with these quantifiers in more complex formal deductions. Well, let's wrap this up by looking at some proof techniques which are generally useful for constructing proofs, especially when you find yourself feeling a little bit stuck. The first technique is to construct an informal proof just to see how the proof works. Often this is a matter of convincing yourself that the argument really does work and it helps to see the kinds of steps you're going to use when you construct the formal proof for it. And that's technique two. Once you've constructed an informal proof, you can use the steps that you employed in that proof to guide your construction of the formal proof. And finally, for universal type proofs, you can always work backward. This doesn't work so well with existential type proofs, but for universal proofs, it can really show you kind of where you're going. Let's have a look at an example of this with a larger derivation than the ones we considered in prior videos. Sometimes when you first see a proof like this, uh, it's easy to feel a little bit overwhelmed. But proofs proceed by steps, and the first thing that we can do is to assess where we want to go. So let's look at our goal sentence here. So what we want to prove in the course of this is that something is an M and an R as we see on line 13. Well, let's have a look at our premises here and just reason this out. Let's focus on this third premise here that tells us that something is a D. We can adopt an arbitrary constant for this the way we've done before and say E is a D. And that gets us going somewhere. E is a D and we'll say, ah, but by the second premise, if E is either a D or an F, then E is an R. Well, since E is a D, then E is a D or E is an F is true, and so E is an R as well. But then by our first premise, we can see that if E is an H or E is an R, then E is an M and E is a D. What we want to show is that E is an M and E is an R, but we can see already the way to do this because by showing that E is a D, we get by the second premise that E is an R. And then by showing that E is an R, we can get by the first premise that E is an M. I'm glossing over the steps here that incorporate disjunction introduction and conjunction elimination. These are reasonably obvious, but we're gonna have to do them in our proof. In this case, it looks as though this proof works. And we've reasoned through the way that we would construct a proof for this by picking out an arbitrary object that corresponds with our something that's a D on the third line and then running through the universal statements in lines one and two. The fact that we started out by picking an arbitrary object that is a D suggests that this whole proof is going to consist of an existential elimination since that's how we proceed when we introduce an arbitrary constant in order to get rid of an existential sign on a sentence like three. So let's go ahead and do this. We'll introduce a new subproof and we'll take a constant here, E, which we box to show that it's just arbitrarily selected, and we say that E is a D. I'm going to make E yellow throughout just to make it clear how this constant makes its way through the proof. Okay, so E is a D. Now let's look back at the second premise, which was what we moved on to next once we picked our arbitrary object that is a D. We can perform universal elimination on this using our constant E. We can do this because of the nature of constants and also because of the nature of universal statements. If a universal statement like two on our line here, which says that everything, if it's a D or an F is a R, will apply to every object in the domain. And we've already stipulated that constants have to pick out an object in the domain. So on these grounds, we can perform a universal elimination on two, which gets us that if E is a D or an F, then it's an R by universal elimination. Well, from four, we can straightforwardly get that supposing that E is a D, then E is a D or it's an F. That's just by disjunction introduction. And this is just the antecedent to our conditional sentence on five. So we can conditional eliminate this down to E is an R. Now this is nice because we can already see that we're headed in the right direction since we want to show that something is an R for our conclusion and we have just such an R, E. So now it's a matter of showing that something is an M as well. And in this respect, we're going to perform a pretty similar operation on the first premise because as we can see, we want to free up those sentences that are in there so that we can get through modus ponens or conditional elimination that E is an M. Let's try this in a slightly different order than we did with the second premise. We'll say that E is an H 
or E is an R. Now this looks a good deal like the antecedent of our conditional in 1. In fact, E it looks like satisfies this antecedent. And so we can perform universal elimination once more to get this into a straightforward conditional that's about E rather than about for all X. Once again, by universal elimination on premise 1, if E is an H or an R, then it's an M and it's a D. Okay, so now it's just another application of modus ponens, which gets us that E is an M and E is a D. For the sake of keeping our proof within the screen, I'm going to combine two simple steps on 11 here to get E is an M and E is an R. And these two steps are conjunction elimination on 10 and then conjunction introduction from 7. So if we wanted to split out these steps, we would use conjunction elimination to get E as an M, and then we'd use conjunction introduction to get E as an M and E as an R, pulling down our E as an R from line 7. This gets us very close to where we want to go. We say, generalizing on this, something is an M and it's an R. This looks like it's taken us right where we want to go, but we have one more step to take, which is that we have to close this subproof that we've been in since line 4. Now, as you'll recall, we started by existential elimination because we wanted to talk about some arbitrary object that is a D so that we could get going with line 3. And so what this whole proof constitutes is an existential elimination that runs from lines 3 and this whole subproof 4 to 12. And that completes the proof. So as you can see, we've used these techniques of constructing an informal proof recognizing the steps that we're using in the informal proof and their correspondence with the formal rules, and then writing out the whole thing using the technique of working backwards from universal proofs if need be. And so what looked like a forest of formulas, if you will, at the outset of this proof has, by application of these techniques and careful thought about what makes the argument work, given us the formal derivation that we wanted. Well, this concludes our course in first order predicate logic. I hope you had fun. Thanks for joining. And if you have any further questions, just let me know in the comments or by email.